the second Sunday of Easter. The Gospel. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Two of the disciples of Jesus were on their way to a village called Emmaus, seven miles from Jerusalem, and they were talking together about all that had happened. Now, as they talked this over, Jesus himself came up and walked by their side, but something prevented them from recognising him. He said to them, What matters are you discussing as you walk along? They stopped short, their faces were very downcast. Then one of them, called Cleopas, answered him, You must be the only person staying in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have been happening there these last few days. What things? he asked. All about Jesus of Nazareth, they answered, who proved that he was a great prophet by the things he said and did in the sight of God and of the whole people, and how our chief priests and our leaders handed him over to be sentenced to death and had him crucified. Our own hope had been that he would be the one to set Israel free. And this is not all. Two whole days have gone by since it all happened, and some women from our group have astounded us. They went to the tomb in the early morning, and when they did not find the body, they came back to tell us they had seen a vision of angels who declared that he was alive. Some of our friends went to the tomb and found everything exactly as the women had reported, but of him they saw nothing. Then he said to them, You foolish men, so slow to believe the full message of the prophets. Was it not ordained that the Christ should suffer and so enter into his glory? Then, Starting with Moses and going through all the prophets, he explained to them the passages throughout the scriptures that were about himself. When they drew near to the village to which they were going, he made as if to go on, but they pressed him to stay with them. It is nearly evening, they said, and the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. Now, while he was with them at the table, he took the bread and said the blessing. Then he broke it and he handed it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognised him, but he had vanished from their sight. Then they said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us as he talked to us on the road and exclaimed the scriptures to us? They set out that instant and returned to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven assembled together with their companions, who said to them, Yes, it is true. The Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then they told their story of what had happened on the road and how they had recognised him at the breaking of bread. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. During excavations in Egypt uh, during the 1920s, archaeologists found a handful of wheat in a tomb belonging to one of the ancient kings. That wheat would have been about 5,000 years old. Someone decided to plant the grains, and to their amazement, they grew and came to life. After all those 5,000 years, isn't that amazing? Well, my faith in the resurrection will be like those dormant grains until I know Jesus as a real living person who touches my life in the here and now with his 
reassuring presence. There is an old French proverb which says that God often visits us, but most of the time we're not at home. That's what happened to doubting Thomas. How are we not at home? Well, we're not at home if our faith in him is merely academic, or if we believe that science explains everything. Of course, that doesn't at all mean that the Church is anti-science, as some make out, some historians make out this. The first observatory, for instance, in the world, was in the Vatican. The first universities in Europe, which became the model of all universities, were mostly founded by the Catholic Church, and they included faculties on natural philosophy and physics. Now, if the Church were anti-science, they would never have had those faculties. I know the Church censored Galileo, but it wasn't because the Church discounted his theory that the Earth circled the Sun, as some make out. But the Church wanted him to treat it as a hypothesis rather than the undisputed truth, but he would have none of it. That was the nub of the problem. It was a breakdown in communication, really. The Protestant Church at the time dismissed the whole theory as anti-scriptural. Thomas would not believe that Jesus had risen unless he had seen him in the flesh. But Jesus gently tells him, Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Now, that's surely you and me as well. The resurrection has, to me, has more to do with the transformation of the inner man or woman than seeing Jesus in the flesh. If Jesus were to walk into this church right now, and after all the initial excitement had died down, would there be any guarantee that any of us would go out and live better Christian lives? I doubt it very much. Jesus, for instance, he didn't come down from the cross when challenged, because he knew that if he did, the people would still not believe in him. He worked hundreds of miracles for all of them to see, even raising Lazarus from the dead, and still they put him on a cross. It's a bit like global warming today. Despite the evidence, many people still don't believe in it. The doctrine of the resurrection is the cornerstone on which our Christianity rests. Tamper with that and we shake the very foundations of our faith. Saint Paul reminds us that if Christ is not risen, then all our teaching is in vain. The Church wasn't built on doubting Thomas's but on the unshakable belief that Jesus rose from the dead in his human body and is still with us, with us in the church until the end of time. Thomas wanted to touch the Lord's wounds, but it is he who is touched when the risen, the risen Jesus pays him a surprise visit. We don't doubt his presence, though, when we receive him in Holy Communion, it is there that we draw close to him.
Thank you all very much for listening and God